Distal radius fractures. There are toe bones that make up the forearm. The ulna is on the small finger, pinky, side. The radius is on the thumb side of the forearm. The end portion towards the wrist is referred to as the distal end. The wrist joint is formed by the radius and a set of four small bones in the wrist, collectively known as the proximal carpal row. This joint is primarily responsible for allowing motions in multiple planes, including backward and forward bending motions, side-to-side -side motions, and circular motions. Distal radius articulates with the scaphoid and lunate. This joint is often referred to as the wrist joint proper. The articular surface of the distal radius is concave in appearance presenting two articular facets separated by a slight anteroposterior ridge. These are the scaphoid and lunate fossae, which are in direct articulation with the corresponding carpal bones. The radial styloid process is a projection of bone on the lateral surface of the distal radius bone. When the radius breaks near the wrist, it is called a distal radius fracture. It is an extremely common type of fracture, and is most commonly seen in older females and young males. Causes and Risk Factors The break usually happens due to falling on an outstretched or flexed hand. It can also happen by a direct trauma in a car accident, a bike accident, a skiing accident or another sports activity. Due to osteoporosis, the risk of these fractures increases with age and even a minor fall. Individuals 60 years of age and older tend to experience these fractures more often than others. However, children between 5 to 15 years are also prone to these fractures. Symptoms Immediate, sharp wrist pain at the moment of a fall or accident sometimes accompanied by the sound or sensation of a snap numbness and or inability to move the wrist or hand wrist swelling and tenderness which begins immediately that only worsens deformity of the forearm or wrist the most common type of distal radius fracture is a cole's fracture which produces a very distinctive sign known as the dinner fork deformity viewed from the side the wrist has the appearance of an overturned fork. Bruising of the wrist and forearm. Diagnosis The physician will ask the patient for a description of symptoms, how they started, and what triggers them. He will examine the wrist and forearm and may also manipulate the wrist or ask patients to perform certain hand or wrist movements, if they are able. The doctor will need x-rays of the wrist to confirm the diagnosis. Three important measurements can be determined, using the x-ray. These measurements are often abnormal when a fracture of the distal radius is present. Radial inclination. It is an angle between a line perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the radius and a line joining the distal tip of the radial styloid and the distal sigmoid notch usually 21 degrees to 25 degrees volar tilt the angle between the line is drawn between the most distal points of the dorsal and volar lips of the distal radius on a true lateral view and the line drawn perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the radius normally 11 degrees to 12 degrees volar radial height Distance between a line drawn at the tip of the radial styloid process perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the radius. And a second perpendicular line at the level of the distal articular surface of the ulnar head. Normally 11 to 12 millimeters. In some cases, especially in intra-articular fractures. The doctor may order a computed tomography CT scan, which provides 3D pictures of the broken bone. This can help with surgical planning. Classification Imaging will also help determine the classification of the fracture.
Classification of a distal radius fracture can have an effect on how it is treated. Displaced versus non-displaced fractures. These terms describes whether the bones or fragments have moved out of place or are still in place. A fracture that does not extend into the joint is called an extra-articular fracture. The two prominent types of the extra-articular distal radius fractures are a Coles fracture which is a fracture of the distal radius within 2 cm of the articular surface, with posterior displacement of the distal fragment. It is the most common type of wrist fracture, accounting for 90% of all distal radius fractures. A Smith fracture is the less common, it is the reverse of a Coles fracture. It may result from a falling on a bent wrist. The distal fragment typically shifts down toward the palm side. An intraarticular fracture is one that extends into the wrist joint. The most common intraarticular fracture is Barton's fracture which is a fracture in the coronal plane of the radius that extends into the wrist joint. A Barton fracture can be described as volar or dorsal, depending on whether the volar or dorsal rim of the radius is involved. There is usually associated dorsal subluxation or dislocation of the radiocarpal joint in the direction of the fracture fragment. Chauffeur fractures are intraarticular fractures of the radial styloid process. Die punch fracture is a depressed fracture of the lunate fossa of the articular surface of the distal radius. When a bone is broken into more than two pieces, it is called a comminuted fracture. A green stick fracture occurs when a bone bends, instead of breaking completely into separate pieces. The fracture looks similar to what happens when you try to break a small, green, branch on a tree. Most green stick fractures occur in children younger than 10 years of age. When a fractured bone breaks the skin, it is called an open fracture. These types of fractures require immediate medical attention because of the risk for infection. Treatment Once physicians take into account factors like the age and activity level of the patient and the nature of the fracture, they can determine if the fracture can be reset without surgery or requires surgery. Non-surgical treatment necessitates acceptable fracture criteria which are Radial height, less than 5 mm shortening Radial inclination, less than 5 degree change Articular step-off, less than 2 mm Dorsal angulation less than 5 degrees or within 20 degrees of the contralateral distal radius. If the fracture is in a good position, a splint or cast is simply applied until the bone completely heals. Displaced fractures must undergo a closed reduction in an attempt to achieve an anatomic or acceptable reduction. Various techniques can be employed, however all involve ensuring sufficient traction and manipulation. Adequate anesthesia or analgesia, such as conscious sedation or hematoma block, are necessary for closed reduction. Once the bone has been positioned properly, the wrist is placed in a long arm cast or splint to keep it in position while bones heal. A splint may be used initially to allow swelling to go down, then it can be replaced with a sturdier cast. Post-reduction radiographs must be obtained to evaluate the quality of the reduction. Then radiographs repeated after three days and then one week to check for displacement. If the reduction is maintained, the splint may be converted to a cast and immobilized for a total of six weeks. Should the acceptable criteria not be met or if the reduction is not maintained and is no longer acceptable, surgical intervention should be recommended. The goal of surgical treatment is to achieve acceptable alignment and stable fixation for early motion. There are various methods of fixation, including pins, external fixators, dorsal plates, and a volar plate or any combination of these techniques.
Percutaneous pinning is useful in in extra-articular fractures with a stable volar cortex. It is unacceptable when the volar cortex is comminuted, and therefore unstable, as there is not enough bony fixation to maintain reduction. The pins will be removed in a few weeks. Once healing of the fracture is evident and or the cast is removed, Open reduction internal fixation with plating is typically necessary for displaced intraarticular fractures greater than 2 mm. Barton's fractures. Die punch fractures. Severe osteoporosis. Volar or dorsal comminution. Comminuted and displaced extraarticular fractures and if the pre-reduction radiographs indicates instability the external fixation is used for open fractures, highly comminuted fractures or for medically unstable patients unable to undergo a lengthy procedure. It is usually combined with percutaneous pinning technique. The wrist will be in a splint for 10 days to allow pain and swelling to subside. It is essential to limit the duration of external fixation to a maximum of 8 weeks and to perform aggressive hand therapy to maintain range of motion of the hand. Recovery Almost all patients will have some stiffness in the wrist. This will generally lessen in the month or two after the cast is taken off or after surgery and continue to improve for at least two years. A course of physical therapy will be prescribed to help patients restore range of motion, decrease swelling, and rebuild strength. The wrist and arm should be functional for most activity by 8 to 10 weeks after surgery. After about 3 to 6 months, most patients can resume heavier wrist or arm activity in sports. Full distal radius fracture recovery generally takes about a year. Potential Complications Unrelenting pain may be a sign of complex regional pain syndrome, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, which must be treated aggressively with medication or nerve blocks. Malunion of the bone and continued deformity. It can be treated with corrective osteotomy of the malunion. Tendon damage from an internal plate. A second surgery may be needed to correct this problem. Post-traumatic arthritis in the wrist, particularly with intra-articular fractures. Residual pain and stiffness. Median nerve compression. More common in patients who heal in a significant degree of malunion. Pin site or incision infections.